In chapter 20, we will continue our study of the cardiovascular system, focusing on blood vessels and circulation. Blood vessels are the conducting tubes that distribute the blood. There are three primary types of blood vessels in the human body. Arteries, capillaries, and veins. Let's look at the structure and function of blood vessels first. This slide shows the cardiovascular circulation. Arteries, which are shown in the figure, always carry blood away from the heart to the capillaries, and they are typically colored red on models because in general they carry oxygenated blood. Capillaries are the smallest, most abundant type of blood vessel and permit diffusion between the bloodstream and interstitial fluids in order to facilitate nutrient and waste exchange. Veins always return blood from the capillaries to the heart, are typically colored blue on models because in general they carry deoxygenated blood. Here we can see the structure of a typical artery and vein. In this course, you will also be examining the difference of the tuna in arteries and veins, which is shown here. Arteries tend to have a round lumen and a relatively thick wall, while veins tend to have a flattened, collapsed, or irregularly shaped lumen with relatively thin walls. The tunica interna of arteries is rippled and possesses an internal elastic membrane. However, the tunica interna of veins is often smooth and the internal elastic membrane is absent. Arteries also have a thick tunica media, which is dominated by smooth muscle and elastic fibers, while veins, on the other hand, have a thin tunica media composed of smooth muscle and collagen fibers. Arteries possess an external elastic membrane within its tunica media while veins lack an external elastic membrane. Arteries also possess a tunica externa made of collagen and elastic fibers. The tunica externa of veins possesses collagen and smooth muscle. If we look at some of the characteristics of arteries, we can see there is some distinctive differences, as noted. One difference on the slide is the difference in pressure between the arteries and veins. Arteries are typically under high pressure coming out of the heart, distributing blood to the systemic circulation. And that is why they possess large amounts of elastic tissue compared to other vessels. The thick tunica media and thinner tunica externa allow for this function, which is important in arteries since they are under such high pressure and have to deliver the contents greater distances than the veins of the body. In general, there is no exchange that occurs in the arteries. The transport is of oxygenated blood, and again, they are read on models and in diagrams. If we look at some specific types of arteries and arterioles, we can examine some of the differences between them. Elastic arteries are also known as conducting vessels. They are found near the heart because they can withstand the highest blood pressures, as in the aorta and its branches. They possess large amounts of elastin fibers in the tunica media, which forms what is described as a holy sheet similar to Swiss cheese, and has substantial smooth muscle in the tunica media. However, 
elastic arteries have little ability to vasoconstrict. Muscular arteries are also known as dis distribution vessels. They deliver blood to specific body organs like the renal artery, mesenteric artery, and gastric artery as an example. The tunica media of the muscular arteries has relatively more smooth muscle and less elastin than elastic arteries. These vessels are very active in vasoconstriction and are also less distensible. Arterioles are also known as resistance vessels. They help regulate blood flow into capillaries. The tunica media in arterioles is almost entirely smooth muscle with little to no elastin fibers, and the tunica externa is poorly defined. Capillaries also have some distinct characteristics. Capillaries connect arteries to veins and are the site of nutrient and waste exchange. A capillary is a microscopic channel that supplies blood to the tissues themselves in a process called perfusion. The capillaries are the smallest of all blood vessels with diameters generally less than 10 micrometers and are composed of a single layer of squamous epithelium and a sparse basal lamina. They may also possess parasites associated with the epithelium to help stabilize the layer. Here we can see some types of capillaries. Continuous capillaries are the most abundant. These capillaries possess an uninterrupted layer of squamous cells. The cells are connected by tight junctions and have few intercellular clefts. These are common in skin, muscle, and brain tissues. Fenestrated capillaries have an endothelial lining that possesses many pores or fenestrations and intercellular clefts. Tight junctions are less numerous and common in areas where filtration and absorption of dissolved particles is an important part of the organ function. So you will find these types of capillaries in the digestive tract, endocrine glands, and kidneys as an example. Sinusoidal capillaries are least common of the three types. These are leaky capillaries because tight junctions are rare and intercellular clefts are abundant. These are commonly found in areas where cells must leave circulation and move to the tissues like bone marrow, liver, and lymph organs. Kupfer cells are a specialized phagocytic cell found in the sinusoidal capillaries of the liver. They act as macrophages that extend into the lumen of the capillary to capture prey. Here you can see the structure of the capillary bed, which is also known as the microcirculation. Capillary beds possess several important structures, such as true capillaries, where the actual exchange occurs, a precapillary sphincter, which is a circular muscle that opens and closes to allow blood to flow into the true capillary vessel or to bypass them. A meta-arterial or thoroughfare channel, which is basically a vascular shunt. And these are the vessels that allow the blood to bypass the true capillaries and be redirected to tissues that may be in need of an increased blood supply. Also, you can see the arteriovenosus anastomosis that may bypass the capillary bed and lead directly to the venous system. These are also known as collateral circuits. 
The characteristics of veins are shown here. Veins transport blood towards the heart and again are generally labeled blue on models and in general transport deoxygenated blood. Veins possess valves which are formed from folds of the tunica interna and function to prevent the backflow of blood. If a valve fails, blood will pool abnormally in the vessel, causing it to become grossly distended. If near the surface, it is visible through the skin and is called a varicose vein. Varicose veins of the anal canal are called hemorrhoids. Veins also serve as our blood reservoirs because the pressure is so low within these vessels compared to arteries or capillaries. And in fact, on average, about 65% of the total blood volume is in our systemic veins at any given time. Here we can see a comparison of some of the veins and venules. There are um, large veins, which include the superior and inferior vena cava, and their tributaries. All three vessel layer walls are present in large veins. The slender tunica media is surrounded by a thick tunica externa composed of a mixture of collagen and elastin fibers. Some large veins are flattened with extremely thin walls. These are called venous sinuses and are found in the heart like the coronary sinus and the brain like the dural sinus. Medium-sized veins range from 2 to 9 millimeters in diameter and the tunica media is thin and contains smooth muscle cells and collagen fibers. The thickest layer is the tunica externa which contains smooth muscle cells and longitudinal bundles of elastic and collagen fibers. Valves are particularly within the veins of the limbs, are also common in the medium-sized veins. Venules drain capillary beds into veins. Venules are extremely porous and are often more similar in structure and function to capillaries than to veins. Many venules possess only an endothelium and parasites, while others may have a very scanty tunica media and a thin tunica externa. Here you can see a varicose vein and varicose veins as seen in the figure are commonly found in the lower limbs. This slide shows the distribution of blood within the body and you can see that veins are typically the reservoir of blood with about 65 percent of blood being in our veins at any one time in the human body. And here we can see the basic comparison of arteries versus veins that we just discussed. Next look at blood flow, pressure, and resistance. So we can examine some of the physiological concepts that are related to the function of our cardiovascular system. Let's start with blood pressure. Blood pressure is defined as the force per unit area exerted on the wall of a blood vessel by the blood contained within it. And pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury. In general, Blood flow is directly proportional to the blood pressure. So an increased pressure results in increased flow and is inversely proportional to peripheral resistance. Increased resistance results in decreased flow. Changes in blood pressure occur as blood flows through the cardiovascular system, as you can see in the slide. The heart generates a pressure of around 100 millimeters of mercury as it pumps blood into the aorta, which has a cross-sectional area 
of roughly 4.5 centimeters squared. At each branching of the arterial system, the arterial pressure drops as it is pushed into ever increasing smaller and smaller branches. At the start of the peripheral capillaries, the arterial pressure has fallen to approximately 35 millimeters of mercury, and by the time blood reaches the venules, it has fallen to approximately 18 millimeters of mercury. By the time blood reaches the vena cava, the pressure is approximately 5 millimeters of mercury. Because the pressure is so low in veins, blood tends to pool in veins, and the venous flow depends on the muscular pump of our skeletal muscles and the respiratory pump of our respiratory system to keep the blood moving towards the heart. The arterial pressure is not constant. It rises during ventricular contraction and falls during ventricular relaxation as the arterial walls stretch and then recoil. The peak blood pressure measured during ventricular contraction is called the systolic pressure. And the minimum blood pressure at the end of the ventricular relaxation phase is called the diastolic pressure. In recording blood pressure, we separate systolic and diastolic pressures. An average adult blood pressure is around 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. The difference between systolic and diastolic pressure is the pulse pressure. The mean arterial pressure, or MAP, is calculated by adding one-third of pulse pressure to the diastolic pressure. Make sure that you can calculate pulse pressure and mean arterial pressure. The pulse points of the body are shown here, and you should be able to identify the various pulse points of the body. The pulse is most readily measured at the radial artery. Another typical pulse point that is commonly palpated is the brachial artery and the common carotid artery. Blood pressure measurement is shown here. And you will measure blood pressure using a sphinctomanometer and a stethoscope. When measuring blood pressure, you can also often oscillate the Korakoff sounds. The first heart sound that is heard is systolic blood pressure, and the last heart sound that is heard is diastolic blood pressure. There are many factors that can affect blood pressure. Cardiac output, compliance, blood volume, the viscosity of blood, and peripheral resistance, which is determined by the vessel length and diameter. Cardiac output is one factor that can impact blood pressure, and as cardiac output increases, as during exercise, blood pressure increases. As cardiac output decreases, like when you're resting, blood pressure decreases. Compliance is the ability of any vessel to expand to accommodate increased content. A metal pipe, for example, is not compliant, but a balloon is. Veins are more compliant than arteries and can expand to hold more blood, resulting in less pressure. When vascular de disease causes stiffening of arteries, like in arteriosclerosis, compliance will be reduced and resistance to blood flow is increased. The result is higher pressure within the vessel and reduced blood flow. Blood volume is another factor that impacts blood pressure. 
as blood volume increases, like during pregnancy, blood pressure increases. As blood volume decreases, as would with hemorrhaging, blood pressure decreases. Hypervolemia is an abnormally high level of fluid and blood within the body. Hypovolemia is an abnormally low level of fluid and blood within the body. The viscosity of blood is also another factor that can impact blood pressure. Thick fluids are more sluggish than a thin fluid. So liquids with low viscosity like water flow at low pressures. Thick syrupy fluids like molasses would flow under high pressure. Whole blood has a viscosity four to five times that of water due to the presence of plasma proteins and the formed elements found within blood. Increases in viscosity, as when you are dehydrated, will cause an increase in blood pressure. A decrease in viscosity will decrease blood pressure. Peripheral resistance is the amount of opposition or friction blood encounters as it flows through the vessels. As resistance increases, blood pressure increases. As resistance decreases, blood pressure decreases. There are several factors affecting resistance and therefore blood pressure. Vessel length is one of them. Friction occurs between the moving blood and the walls of the vessel. The longer the vessel length, the greater the surface area in contact with the blood, and therefore the greater the resistance. The most dramatic changes in blood vessel length occur between birth and adulthood. Once we reach adulthood, vessel length is relatively constant. Vessel diameter can also impact peripheral resistance. Friction also occurs between layers of fluid moving at different speeds. The layer of blood closest to the vessel wall is slowed down by friction with the endothelial surface. The adjacent layer of blood is slowed down by friction with the more superficial layer. As blood proceeds towards the capillaries, the diameter of arteries decreases markedly. As blood returns towards the heart, the diameter of veins increases. This gradually diminishes as the distance from the wall increases. In a small diameter vessel, all the blood is slowed to some degree, and therefore resistance is high. In a large diameter vessel, the central region is unaffected by events at the periphery, so the resistance is relatively low. If we examine length versus diameter, we can see that differences in diameter have much more significant effects on resistance than do differences in length. If two vessels are equal in diameter, but one is twice as long as the other, the longer vessel offers twice as much resistance to blood flow. But for two vessels of equal length, one twice the diameter of the other, the narrower one offers 16 times as much resistance to blood flow. For this reason, the brain typically initiates changes in blood vessel diameter by vasoconstriction and vasodilation to regulate our blood pressure. However, abnormal narrowing of a vessel due to plaque buildup can lead to hypertension and increased risk of heart attack and or stroke. Blood velocity is the rate of blood flow through a vessel, and velocity is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area of the vessels. The more surface area, the more friction, the slower blood flows. Even though individual capillaries are small, there are so many of them that collectively they have a very high surface area. 
Capillaries have the highest cross-sectional area and blood traveling through them is therefore very slow. On the other hand, arteries and veins are larger with high individual surface areas, but they are far less numerous than the capillaries. So collectively, they generate less cross-sectional surface area and blood moves through them faster. Here you can see the impact of vessels that have a built up of plaque in them, which can occur for a number of reasons. The buildup of plaque in the vessels would inhibit the flow of blood due to an abnormal narrowing of the vessel. And as noted previously, this can lead to a heart attack or stroke. Here is another example of vessels that have been clogged in a diagnostic test, a coronary angiogram, that makes visible the two occluded arteries in the figure. The skeletal muscle pump, as noted previously, is important in assisting venous blood to be returned to the heart. The contraction of skeletal muscles compresses the veins and the blood within them and increases the pressure in that area. That forces blood closer to the heart. In addition, you can also see the importance of the one-way valves so that our venous blood only flows in one direction. Now let's examine capillary exchange in a little more detail. Capillary exchange is a dynamic process that includes diffusion by filtration and reabsorption mechanisms. You should recall that diffusion is the net movement of ions or molecules from an area where their concentration is higher to an area where their concentration is lower. Diffusion occurs continuously across capillary walls, but different substances use different routes and mechanisms for movement into and out of the bloodstream. Here you can see this slide shows the systemic blood flow during rest mild exercise, and maximal exercise in a healthy young individual. The cardiovascular centers make extensive adjustments to cardiac output and blood distribution during changes in physical activity. At rest, cardiac output averages 5,800 milliliters per minute. During light exercise, the cardiac output rises to approximately 9,500 milliliters per minute. And this is largely due to the increased venous return. When someone is exercising very heavily, cardiac output rises towards the maximal level, about 17,500 milliliters per minute. You can also see the distribution of blood flow during rest, light exercise, and heavy exercise to various organs of the body. One thing to note, you will notice that the brain receives a continuous supply of blood during both resting, mild exercise, and in addition, maximal exercise. So blood flow is not redistributed at any point in time to the brain. But it can be redistributed to the organs that are needing it most like your skeletal muscles and redirect it away from other organs like your gastrointestinal system. This slide shows a summary of the factors maintaining vascular homeostasis and it goes over adequate blood flow, blood pressure distribution, perfusion, 
involving autoregulatory, neural, and endocrine mechanisms. Let's examine some of those mechanisms in a little more detail here, starting with the baroreceptor reflexes that are used for maintaining vascular homeostasis. The cardiovascular control centers are primarily located in the hypothalamus and require the stimulation of baroreceptors and chemoreceptors. The medulla oblongata can coordinate respiratory activities to enhance their control. Baroreceptors are located in the carotid sinuses, aorta, and right atrium and detect changes in blood pressure. When the baroreceptors detect an increase in blood pressure, they send a signal to the hypothalamus, which in turn triggers vasodilation, a decrease in heart rate, and a reduction in cardiac output. When they detect a decrease in blood pressure, they send a signal to the hypothalamus, which in turn triggers vasoconstriction, an increase in heart rate, and then a subsequent increase in cardiac output. And you can see how those differences are outlined here in the slide. Chemoreceptors, on the other hand, will respond to changes in chemicals in the blood composition. And we'll examine those in just a moment. So within some of the homeostatic mechanisms that help regulate blood pressure, blood volume, and blood flow, we have both an endocrine or hormonal regulation and a neural regulation. The neural regulation involves the baroreceptors and chemoreceptors of the body. Chemoreceptors are also located in the carotid sinuses and aortic arch and as noted will detect changes in the composition of the blood. When the chemoreceptors detect an increase in carbon dioxide, for example, or a decrease in oxygen concentration, or even pH, they stimulate mechanisms like vasoconstriction or increased cardiac output and blood pressure to bring the body back to homeostasis. The endocrine mechanism involves a number of hormones, ADH or antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, the renin angiotensin II mechanism, aldosterone, epinephrine and norepinephrine, atrial natriuretic peptide, and nitric oxide. So let's look at some of the hormones that are involved in vascular regulation. Antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, is secreted by the pituitary gland. And ADH works by enhancing water reabsorption in the kidney so that urine output is reduced and blood volume rises. This results in increased blood volume, which increases blood pressure. The renin-angiotensin II mechanism, detect, when it detects a drop in blood pressure or blood volume by the baroreceptors of the kidney, Renin will then be released and activates angiotensin 1, which is already in the bloodstream, and is then converted to the activated form, angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a very potent vasoconstrictor. This increases the peripheral resistance and blood pressure rises. In addition, angiotensin can stimulate the release of other hormones like aldosterone. Aldosterone is secreted by the cortex of the adrenal gland and enhances the reabsorption of sodium ions by the kidney, which in turn increases water reabsorption by the kidneys and further reduces urine output. With the increase in water in the blood, the blood volume rises and the blood pressure increases. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are secreted by the medulla of the adrenal gland 
an increased heart rate, which in turn increases cardiac output, and the increase in cardiac output causes increased blood pressure. If there is an excessive blood volume or low blood pressure, this triggers the secretion of atrial natriuretic peptide, or ANP, by the right atrium, and, in addition, brain natriuretic peptide, or BNP, by the muscle cells of the ventricle. Both of these, ANP and BNP, reduce sodium reabsorption so that the body experiences an increase in sodium loss in urine. Water follows the sodium, so the blood volume goes down. ANP and BNP further inhibit the release of ADH, aldosterone, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. All of the things, these things together will lower blood pressure. And nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator which reduces peripheral resistance and in turn reduces blood pressure. Here is a summary of the mechanisms regulating arterial smooth muscle and veins. And you can see the neural component, endocrine, and other factors that are all involved in regulating blood pressure and blood volume. Now let's look at some clinical considerations that finally there is some circulatory pathways that are noted here that you should be familiar with. Here you can see the interaction of the circulatory system with other body systems. The circulatory system interacts with other body systems in a variety of ways. For example, with your digestive system by delivering nutrients to the cells and tissues of the body. And your respiratory system by delivering and getting delivering oxygen and then getting rid of carbon dioxide waste. Re you can review the various systems and the role the cardiovascular system plays in its interaction with that individual organ system. The pulmonary circuit is shown here and demonstrates how the blood exits from the right ventricle, flows into the pulmonary trunk, into the two pulmonary arteries, both right and left, and those vessels branch out to the various pulmonary capillaries, ultimately where gas exchange occurs in the terminal portions, the lung alveoli. Blood then returns to the heart via the four pulmonary veins into the left atrium. Here you can see the major systemic arteries that deliver blood throughout the body. In the laboratory portion, you will be asked to identify some of the major systemic arteries on your lab practical covering the blood vessels. This slide shows the aorta and the branches off of the aortic arch, as well as the descending aorta, which encompasses both the thoracic and abdominal regions. And the three branches off of the aortic arch, brachiocephalic, right subclavian artery, and right common carotid are shown as well. and the left subclavian artery is also noted, the three branches being brachiocephalic, common carotid, subclavian, or BCS. Here you can see the arteries supplying the head and neck and the branches from the common carotid artery that gives rise to some other vessels internal and external carotids. This slide shows the arteries serving the brain and the important circle of Willis is also highlighted in this slide. It is one of the structures you will have to know for your lab practical. 
The arteries of the thoracic and abdominal regions are noted here, as well as the major branches in the abdominal region, like the celiac trunk, superior mesenteric, hepatic, gastric, renal, and inferior mesenteric arteries, as well as others. Here you can see the major branches of the aorta, and this is in a flow chart um, example. The major branches of the iliac arteries are demonstrated here for you. The major arteries serving the thoracic and upper limb are noted on this slide. And you can think of the rest of the slides and, and the slides that we're going over here again as an additional review or study aid because you will be asked to identify certain vessels in the laboratory portion of the course. In addition, your lecture instructor may also ask you to identify certain vessels on the lecture portion of your exam in class. Major arteries of the upper limb are shown here. Lower limb arteries are shown in this slide. And you can see the vessels in both the front and back of the leg. Here is a flow chart which summarizes those arteries or vessels for you. Now, the systemic veins. So the major veins of the systemic circulation are shown here for you. And then there is several slides, just like with the arterial system, that will highlight certain vessels of the body for the venous system. So the thoracic and abdominal regions are noted here. There's not as many extensive branches of the abdominal in the abdominal region for the venous system as there is for the arterial system. The head and neck is shown here. Veins of the upper limb are shown here. And also one thing to note, the slide key does depict which of those vessels are deep and or superficial. A flow chart showing the veins that flow into the superior vena cava. So the major vessels. And another flow chart here that shows the venous flow into the inferior vena cava. The superior and inferior vena cava, remember, will ultimately empty into the right atrium of the heart and then make its way into the pulmonary circuit to become reoxygenated. Major veins of the lower limb in a both anterior and posterior view are noted here. And here is a flow chart depicting those major veins of the lower limb. Here you can see the hepatic portal system. Remember the liver is responsible for filtering blood and it receives blood from the systemic circulation via the hepatic artery. In addition, it processes blood via the hepatic portal system. Now the development of blood vessels in fetal circulation is the last point that we will discuss in terms of blood vessels and circulation. There is a number of fetal shunts that you should be familiar with that divert blood from the non-functioning fetal lungs and the fetal liver. You should also be familiar with the adult structure that it becomes once the um, fetus is born. The foramen ovale is one fetal shunt and it's in the interatrial septum which allows blood to flow from the right atrium to the left atrium 
thereby bypassing the non-functioning fetal lungs in utero. The ductus arteriosus is another temporary vessel connecting the aorta to the pulmonary trunk. If some blood does get into the right ventricle and does not get fully shunted with the foramen ovale, the ductus arteriosus can then direct that blood from the pulmonary trunk into the aorta, again bypassing the non-functioning fetal lungs. And the ductus venosus is a link between the umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava through the liver. This concludes our overview of blood vessels and circulation.